here at the Lunara Connect and uh, who are you? I'm Neil Trevitt, uh, I'm the VP at NVIDIA but I'm also president of the Kronos Group. So what is the Kronos Group? Uh, what does it stand for? What's the name? Uh, well the, the name um, <laughs> is a proud history of misspelling Roman deities. <laughs> Uh, but Kronos is an open standards organization. We create um, API specifications that are royalty free to the industry for software using hardware acceleration for things like graphics and parallel computation and vision processing. So it's a lot to do with the GPU, right? GPU is certainly one common accelerator, but not by no means the only one. Uh, for graphics, you would typically have a GPU, and for compute as well. But there are other types of accelerator too. People, some people want to run their code across multiple CPU cores. Some people want to use DSPs. Um, for some of our APIs, like OpenCL, you can even use hardware blocks, uh, ISPs, and uh, as well as FPGAs. So there is a, quite a diverse mix of hardware acceleration that we can we can use. So you're the core of the heterogeneous uh, computing. Uh future, right? Uh, it, like it's a bunch of APIs for people to use all this hardware. It's really important. Right. So uh, the, uh, probably our two best known APIs are OpenGL for graphics and OpenCL for compute acceleration. So for parallel computation, people would use OpenCL. And in OpenCL, yes, you can use a very wide diversity of uh, processor cores. Um, you write your software you divide it up into kernels, and then you can distribute those kernels to run across any of the available computing resources. And those compute resources you can use uh, CPUs, GPUs, hardware, DSPs, FPGAs, the list goes, the list goes on and on. And we just at the beginning of how uh, developers are able to use the hardware, right? What's going to happen in the future? You, you were talking about Vulkan, what, what is that about? Yes, so the, the new generation of APIs, um, uh, the, the key one is Vulkan. Uh, it's still in development, we'll have the spec by the end of the year. And um, unlike the older generations where we had separate APIs for graphics and compute, OpenGL, OpenCL, Vulkan brings everything into one API. So you can mix and match graphics and compute in a much tighter, more intertwined way. So Vulkan has the same kind of queuing structure as OpenCL, but it has all the graphics functionality of um, OpenCL and open G uh, graphics functionality of OpenGL. So you don't need to have two APIs interoperating, everything can be in, in one API framework. And it's going to work on all devices, like from mobile to desktop? That's right. So, again, in the old generation, we started out with OpenGL, which was originally designed for workstations. And then we had the opportunity to bring it to mobile, so we created a subset for OpenGL ES. With Vulkan, uh, we can have one framework. There's going to be no need for Vulkan ES. Uh, the framework has uh, feature set capability, so a particular platform can define which parts of Vulkan you know, will be available on that particular platform, but it'll be the same API framework wherever you go, as you say, from embedded through mobile, through PCs, all the way up to supercomputers. Is it backwards compatible somehow? Like, if people are creating a game, should you just focus on that? Or is it something it's, to do with it's, that? It's not backwards compatible. So it's, uh, there's, the industry is going through a, like a new generation API backward compatibility break. Now, DirectX, is, DirectX 12 is not backwards compatible with DirectX 11. Now, Apple has Metal, which is not, which is entirely new. Vulkan is entirely new. It's it's a clean sheet uh, design. Um, OpenGL has been around for almost 25 years, so you know, it's time for a reset. The systems and the processes have changed a lot in that that time. You need a new generation, clean design. So. If your Vulcan is Vulcan 1.0, is going to be primarily aimed at the developers need absolutely best performance and are willing to put in the time to optimize to the new API. There's going to be quite a long transition, I think, um, where people will continue to use OpenGL and OpenGL ES. It's familiar and it does a very good job, but over time, more and more people who want you know, the, the very best in performance using the new generation features. No, we'll, we'll transition across to, to Vulkan. So it sounds like it's 
how complicated is it to to program for Vulkan? Like, is it something that's really hardcore? You need hundreds of in, uh, uh, developers in a big game company, or is, uh, it's it's not necessarily more difficult. It's just the difficulty is in a slightly different place. So. It's a much lower level API, so all the memory and buffer allocation or the multi-threading is not hidden in the driver anymore. It's just exposed and it's the responsibility of the application developer. So with the old, with the old generation APIs, if you were developing a game that had to port across multiple different platforms, the problem is that the OpenGL or OpenGL ES drivers would behave slightly differently on each of those platforms. So it, it's a higher level API, it's easier to write the code, but you'd have to spend a lot of time forensically trying to understand why it behaves differently on different platforms, and that's where your time went. With Vulkan, it's much lower level, but you can see everything much more clearly. So you might spend a few, a little longer writing the code, because there's more things you have to do, but you won't spend, it'll be much more reliable and much more performance easily across multiple different platforms, so you won't have to spend all that time trying to figure out, ah, you know, what are the drivers doing behind my back? And I think with Vulkan, it's, it'll be a great foundation layer. People developing games will probably never have to use Vulkan, they'll just use a games engine, like Unity or Epic. They will be optimized for Vulkan, and the games developers will just use the games engines that thus run better you know, because of the new API. And Google Android is totally on board with this? Yes. So in the summer at SIGGRAPH, um, Google announced that the Vulkan API, along with OpenGL ES, they're not, they're not throwing out OpenGL ES. OpenGL ES is still going to be there. But Vulkan is going to be um, natively supported on Android in, in an upcoming Android version. They didn't announce precisely when or what, but they have announced their support. So we hear the Nanaro, uh Dinara Connect. Yes. Uh, so you're saying that you want input, you want to discuss, what's yes. going on? Yes. So with the new generation API, uh, Vulkan and Spear, which is the intermediate representation that goes along with Vulkan and OpenCL, a lot of the, the tool chain, the conformance tests, the compiler front ends, uh, Kronos are committed to put all this into open source to enable the open source community like the Nara to contribute and to leverage the work we're doing in open source. So Lenaro, I think the Lenaro community has a real opportunity to contribute to the tools and the front ends and the compilers that we're building and to, you know, to leverage what we're doing in their own projects. Vulkan is going to be much, the ecosystem is going to be much more open source based than OpenGLES ever was, so it really brings the two communities much closer together. More open source based? Yes. So uh, there is some stuff going on with the free Drino, which is kind of cool, no? There's yep. an open source driver that's happening. Yep. That's, what, what do you think about that? Is it something that's uh, very good for the industry? Or? It's always good to have more choices, and developers, some developers where open source drivers are critical, obviously it's good to have the, the drivers available. The, for many hardware vendors, silicon vendors, um, being able to do optimized drivers is still an essential part of the, the real-world business model. That's just why you still need a specification for Vulkan, so people can implement and optimize their own runtimes, even if that particular implementation is not in open source. Because we have a reliable conformance-tested specification, you know, people will be able to use different runtimes, open source runtimes, closed source runtimes, and their application will be able to run reliably across all of those different uh, implementations. There's a lot of uh, competition going on with the GPU and all these ARM, different GPUs and the ARM ecosystem. There's a lot of innovation happening. It's like, it, it feels like every year it's, things are getting twice as better. Yep. Like uh, it's crazy fast. The, like a phone now is as powerful as a home console? It, or? it is. It is. It? is. Yes, you can plug in to many mobile devices, like in my own company, the NVIDIA Shield, you can plug it in and you cannot tell it's not a high-end PC. But for many of the games that are out there, uh, it's amazing how fast mobile graphics has come. And that's really the, the, one of the important attributes of a successful API specification is that it encourages implementation differentiation and competition 
underneath the specification. It shouldn't stifle and mandate implementation. It should you know, encourage multiple different implementation styles that compete. That's what that's what keeps the industry moving along, and that's why we're getting such rapid rapid progress. It's amazing quality, but we still need uh, some kind of. Uh push in the platform because the content is not really kind of like there like uh, so maybe it's something to do with Android too what do you think uh, needs to be like a, a big platform where all the games will be like amazingly awesome on, on phones well I think but well, I mean the Android platform has made amazing progress I mean the number of games that run great on Android is, is actually pretty amazing you go to the Play Store but but Vulcan will help and I think that's why Google have you know, stated their support of this new generation API, it's this low-level explicit access. It's very similar to what the consoles have had for a while. Now, if you're co coding to an Xbox or a PlayStation, you kind of get down and dirty with the hardware. It's much more than you would do with like old-style DirectX or OpenGL. And the fact that that style of API is going to be available on Android and across multiple other platforms too, so you can get a games engine or a games application or other applications that can be written to or can get the best out of the platform and be portable and I think is, is going to encourage a lot of games developers to invest in the API platform and end users will benefit, will get better games that run better. Do you, do you consider uh, the Kronos uh, group and, and your job as kind of like managing what gaming is, what the gaming world, or you no. see it as much bigger than that? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> the, it's going to be computing, right? Our, our job is to enable innovation. We're just working at one layer in the, in the, in the software stack. We're just working at the, the, the interface between hardware and software. Now, it's a very important interface. That's why. You know, we, we think what we do is relevant to many people in the industry, but we're just solving that one problem. And then other people can build games engines, middleware uh, layers, applications you know, that we've never imagined. We're just making sure that application developers and middleware engines can get to the hardware efficiently, and then, you know, then we let the, the rest of the market innovate on top of that. May I ask you shortly, how does it work that all these companies work together and work with you and uh, how do you do the daily work to get things moving? Well, it's um, from a logistical point of view, we just make sure that Kronos is a safe place, we have a good IP framework, you know, everyone understands good, well-proven processes, but that's the boring answer. The real answer is the people that join Kronos, they understand that their business will get better if they cooperate over some things and then compete on other things. If the world is just big competition and we can never agree on a standard to break down barriers to market adoption and to improve technology that can be implemented in an affordable way, then everyone loses. So we need to have a place where we can solve the problems that we don't need to compete on. We should cooperate together. And then we can all go off into the marketplace and. You know, compete on our implementations of those standards. And the people that are inside Kronos kind of realize that their business, as well as the industry, you know, benefits from having a place to, to work together. It sounds a little bit similar to Lenaro, no? It is. It is similar to Lenaro. The, um, lots of the core values are exactly the same, which is why I think there is a real opportunity to work together. Uh, our missions are slightly different. Lenaro is primarily an open source consortium, and we're building products, they're building distributions, they're upstreaming them to, to Linux and Android. Kronos's primary mission is to create specifications uh, that people can implement in hardware. Uh, but increasingly we're using open source to enable those specifications to be used and to be adopted throughout the industry, which is why I think you know, we are coming together. Do you think those things are going fast enough, like Linaro and Kronos, or could it, do, could it go even faster, and how would it go faster? <laughs> It's never fast enough. <laughs> um, I think, well, that's a good question. How would you, we're going about as fast as we can. Uh, there's not a lot of overhead now in the processes. It's, um, we are going pretty much as fast as the hardware can, is evolving and can cope. Now, we could go faster, but um, we're, not, we're not 10 times too slow. Now, we could be, a little bit more efficient, but you know, we're working 
always to make our processes more efficient. But we're, we're pretty much working as fast as people are able right now. Do you think Lenaro is working as fast as they can too? I'm sure they would say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> they could always go faster. But no, Lenaro is doing awesome work. And, um, no. It is actually possible to go too fast sometimes if you, you know, on specification standardization. If you try to standardize something before people have actually agreed what they actually really want, you can actually get a standard that goes haywire and confuses the industry. Uh, for standard creation, in some ways you're just tracking you know, proven implementations and proven market needs. They become um, proven through implementations and products, and then it comes the time to actually standardize. You don't want to do R&D. The design by committee is horrible, it's very slow and argumentative, but refinement of an idea by multiple vendors, that's an awesome thing to do in a committee because you get multiple perspectives and you come up with a much stronger uh, standard foundation that can be, the, you know, can be the foundation for a whole industry. So this, it sounded like there's a lot of standards that you're working on, there's like vision, there's all kinds of camera yeah. stuff. and. Yeah. So this sounds like a little bit like the Google self-driving car stuff or some other things that could go in cameras and like people can read about it online and learn more and... Yeah, on kernels.org, information about everything is there. And again, we're not trying to make self-driving cars, but you know, the self-driving car is going to need a thousand standards. You know, uh, everything from wireless to camera and processing standards. And Kronos can contribute a small part of that galaxy of standards we can contribute to where software needs to communicate well with silicon for effective acceleration. You know, that's where we can add value. We have the right people to create those uh, acceleration APIs.